Thanks very much, Alvaro. Please confirm that you can see my slides in slideshow and that you can hear my voice. Yes. Perfect. Okay, excellent. And uh, nice to uh, make my presentation in the framework of this project. We have been going uh, along this path together with the team from the SEU University, and uh, I'm happy in all my capacities to be part of this project. Uh, I have selected some issues which reflect the type of problems that we have found out during this research project and uh, which to some extent could be regarded as new taxpayers' rights, even if in fact um, uh, they are no different rights, but just an application of the fundamental rights of taxpayers to the context of a digital administration or to an era of digital administration. I have selected for my presentation today five points, and uh, you see them in the agenda, which is now on your screen. And uh, the first point is, of course, outlining the context in which those rights are to operate and the different challenges that we have from the perspective of um, uh, this dramatic change in the administration of taxes. The context of digital administration of taxes is a starting point to see to what extent the balance between collective rights and fundamental rights has to uh, be addressed in a different way. And then I will focus my um, analysis on the uh, se on selected issues arising in the national and cross-border context before reaching some uh, uh, conclusions and looking at possible future challenges. Now, I think that what we have learned throughout this, uh, um, you know, the, the duration of this research project is that, in fact, uh, the, there is a growing use of blockchain and artificial intelligence by tax authorities. And this is uh, very uh, frequently the case in some countries, less frequently the case in other countries. But I want to say that already in 2015, when I was writing uh, the um, general report for IFA with Philip Baker, we, uh, we had the opportunity to see that several in several countries, pre-populated tax returns were already being used, at least in the experimental phase. And that's, of course, many years ago, uh, and uh, that also shows that many things have happened meanwhile because we have now learned that blockchain can definitely facilitate tax compliance and also filing up of uh, pre-populated tax returns. Now, as you can see, the point of uh, using um, uh, digital administration for facilitating tax compliance is certainly something which doesn't create conflict. So in this direction, we have in this uh, in, in, in this field, we have an alignment between the interest of taxpayers and the interest of tax authorities. I should say the interest of those taxpayers who are uh, keen to uh, comply with the payment of taxes. Uh, but in other cases, we have some more conflictive um, situations, such as, for instance, the use of uh, blockchain and artificial intelligence for monitoring tax compliance. So from this perspective, we have to understand that the taxpayer may have different views from the ones that tax authorities come up with. And also the fact that the input that tax authorities receive from the so-called digital administration is not to apply automatically. So uh, this is also something which uh, I will further expand upon during my presentation because we we do see that um, there are some tensions that arise in so far as the human intervention is uh, my marginalized or sidelined, as one can say. And I want to make the point that uh, if we want to uh, take all the good points of digital administration of taxes without the bad ones, we can't completely kick out the human intervention. But before going on that, let me just say that uh, if we use um, blockchain and artificial intelligence, we can monitor compliance in a much better way because we can process data at a much higher speed with much uh, with with more interesting and qualitatively better results than we would <laughs> otherwise be able to do. Now, seeing this from the perspective of uh, monitoring, I think that the first element that arises is the so-called tax profiling. So, in other words. We monitor what taxpayers do. We cluster them according to the features uh, of uh, uh, their own behavior and then uh, see whether and to what extent there may be different categories of risk for one taxpayer or the other. 
Now, the fact that we make this type of analysis is certainly uh, bringing the tax monitoring or the monitoring of tax compliance in line with the so-called risk assessment. And we make a risk assessment that is based on objective factors rather than on random. And in my view, this is quite an important point because for a number of years, the, 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 it, is, it has always been impossible uh, to, for tax authorities to monitor what uh, tax compliance, but now we have, uh, with the blockchain and artificial intelligence, now we have the opportunity to do that uh, in a way that is no longer random. So I think that this is definitely a, a, a step forward in the right direction. Now, this also implies that tax authorities handle a very large uh, amount of information concerning the taxpayer. And that arises from all possible sources, including the electronic ones connected with the behavior of the taxpayer. So in other words, if for instance, we have the case of a taxpayer who is basically left with, uh, you know, who declares that he's left with little or no income, the fact that he behaves uh, in a way that shows a relevant ability to pay and that it basically uh, goes for quite a large consumption that is certainly um, creating a red flag. And therefore, this is uh, showing that there are some inconsistencies uh, between what the taxpayer declares and how the taxpayer behaves. Now, this is all very delicate because uh, in some cases, the taxpayer agrees in, uh, in sort of, uh, you know, waiving the right to data protection. And that is often done before, uh, you know, operating in, on, on some website. But in other cases, the matter is more delicate. And therefore, it is quite important to understand that uh, the fact that we have much more information uh, uh, creates a, a potential in which we might have to see whether there are some clashes with the fundamental rights of taxpayer. And that also arises in so far as data mining activities are conducted. And from this perspective, the fact that data mining can be shared between tax authorities, but can also be collected by some, uh, you know, private entrepreneurs who are making business with that, then it's something which of course also requires addressing the matter from the perspective of taxpayers' rights. Now, all in all, what I think that um, we have to say here is that my impression during this research project is that if we use the instruments of digital administration of taxes properly, then we are making a better administration of taxes. And that also means that we are no longer unnecessarily disturbing the taxpayer with requests for audits, which are just done random because now the audits are more targeted. So I would say that uh, what I'm left after those years of research is that we have made progress. And from this perspective, it is all a matter of making sure that these powerful tools that tax authorities have are used in the appropriate way. So let me move on to present here what I consider something which is recurrent and also um, you know, an element that we find consistently when it comes to determine whether there is an effective protection of taxpayers' rights. And this is something uh, that uh, I have um, analyzed in parallel with this research group, also in connection with a book, in connection with a book that was very recently relate, uh, released by Hart Publisher that I have uh, co-authored with Advocate General Juliane Kokot on protection of taxpayers' rights uh, in international law. Well, um, if on the one hand we have the protection of taxpayers' rights, on the other hand, we have the protection of rights of the community, what I call the collective rights. Now, the collective rights are to make sure that uh, there is an effective reaction to tax non-compliance, because if we don't collect sufficient taxes, there are not enough financial resources to fund the community. So from this perspective, there is a vested interest of the overall community to collection of taxes and to fight against tax non-compliance. So this uh, also shows in our context that the use of blockchain and artificial intelligence 
is certainly something that tremendously enhances the effectiveness of uh, this uh, of the procedures used to secure the protection of those rights. And from this perspective, I want to stress it quite clearly that when it comes to the digital administration of taxes, I do not see that the access of tax authorities to taxpayer data is per se problematic. Because we need to secure an effective protection of rights as to uh, the, of the community to counter tax non-compliance, then we need to put tax authorities in a position in which they can actually do their job. And they can do that in a way that it's better than what they would otherwise do. So this is also good governance. Well, what is problematic is that uh, those information, uh, that information is publicly publicly disseminated. So the public disclosure of this information, in particular in the European Union, it's not okay. So when we go in this direction, so in other words, the uh, access of tax authorities should be granted because otherwise they cannot do their job. But for the purpose of doing their job, it is not necessary for them to disclose it. And it is problematic if they disclose it, because there we end up in a situation where there is, uh, you know, a potential conflict with the individual rights uh, of taxpayers, the fundamental rights of taxpayers which are to be protected and which are to be protected in a way that reflects the fact that taxpayers human rights are no different human rights from the other human rights and therefore uh, you know when we are here with this need to balance out the need for securing an effective protection of collective rights and an effective protection of individual rights of taxpayers then we need to see in particular in the context of this research project, how we can do that. Now, certainly, um, if we are to protect both, we are to do it in a way that it's not about protecting one to the detriment of the other. So I want to stress it, uh, also in line with that other research that I've mentioned, that the need to secure an effective collection of, of taxes may not justify that we make compromises on fundamental rights of individuals. So whenever it's possible, from a methodological perspective, we should secure fundamental rights of taxpayers in a way that doesn't differ from that of individual rights of all other persons, because also taxpayers are holders of human rights. But uh, if we need to make some compromises, then we need to understand how that can concretely take place. Let me get back to the upper part of this slide, which uh, indicated that we need to give tax authorities access to taxpayers' data, but that it's not strictly indispensable to disseminate that data publicly. So this brings us to say that um, if we uh, have tax authorities, uh, you know, becoming engaged in uh, campaigns that imply the public disclosure of that information, that is something which is very critical. It is not strictly indispensable, but it's very critical. Now, you can imagine that I'm referring to naming and shaming, which in my view uh, creates some fundamental um, unnecessary disclosure of uh, taxpayers' rights. And therefore, that, that is certainly something that uh, and makes the protection of collective rights uh, prevail over the ones of individual uh, taxpayers in a way that goes beyond what is strictly needed to secure that goal. But there could be more example of this kind because we uh, might have difficulties also with the so-called public country by country disclosure, regardless of what the position of the European Parliament might have been. Uh, because also in this case, this can lead to effects of unduly boycotting the products of some enterprises in case of potential, um, you know, um, uh, practices that do not reflect, um, do not technically take into account the uh, actual facts of the case. But there is one more point where I see that there is a need to, um, you know, pay attention. And that's the final bullet point of this slide. Um, 
several years ago uh, in a case concerning mutual assistance, C682-15, Berlioz, we have learned from the Court of Justice of the European Union that uh, private parties have the right to obtain, in other words, have legal standing uh, to uh, get that the tax authorities operate in line with the rule of law. Perhaps this is nothing so amazing, because of course, if we have the rule of law as the foundational principle of our system, and if we have that in national constitutions, uh, then one may say there is nothing new about that. What is new about that, that, that is that the Court of Justice stated that there was a legal standing of private parties in a case concerning mutual assistance. Now, that case, in that case, the issue was not specifically raised by the taxpayer, but by a third party holder of information. But in fact, the point which, um, you know, is important for our purposes is that uh, also when it comes to mutual assistance, tax authorities are required to do what the law regulates. They enjoy no more discretionary powers than they would otherwise based on their domestic law. And that can also apply to other procedures which are regulated by, um, by uh, instruments other than national law, which could be, um, you know, for instance, mutual agreement procedures or other administrative procedures. After all, Tax procedures are tax procedures, no matter what their source is. So in the framework of tax procedures, we have to secure a balance between the collective rights and the fundamental rights. And we will see by reference to some cases concerning uh, the so-called national context and the so-called cross-border context, what type of specific issues arise uh, in tax matters and in the new era of uh, digitalized administration. Well, in the national context, um, I think that we can uh, focus the attention upon three groups of cases. And uh, as you might see from the slide number five, which uh, should be now on your screens, um, well, uh, those are very general rights. So you might not expect uh, anything tremendously new. What changes is the context in which they operate. So in other words, uh, my effort in the context also of this research project has been to see to what extent the, uh, let's say, digital administration could uh, basically depart from the overall framework of protecting fundamental rights. And uh, the, the outcome is that some of these rights are more under pressure Others are less under pressure, but that in fact, we do not need to reinvent the fundamental rights because of digital administration, because the context of digital administration creates uh, some um, uh, you know, friction, which has to be addressed in line with the fundamental principle and the fundamental rights uh, of the taxpayers and more in general of private parties. As I have been arguing in this book with Juliane Kokot, there is essentially no longer that much of a difference between the obligations that we put on the taxpayer and those that we put on third parties when it comes, for instance, to, um, you know, keeping books or complying with uh, formal declarations, filling returns and the like. So uh, the first one that I've selected uh, is the right to a reasoned selection of cases to be submitted to tax audits. Now, you can say that this is something which to some extent is connected with the fact that tax authorities in general do not have uh, purely discretionary powers. So they cannot say, I want to uh, audit a taxpayer because he has, uh, you know, two surnames with the same name, like for instance, Professor Alvar Anton. I cannot say that that is something that makes sense. The fact that he has his uh, both surnames are Anton is not meaning anything. It's just something which is irrelevant from a tax perspective. So when we talk at the about the reason selection of cases to be submitted to tax audits, we are talking about something which has always been an obligation for tax authorities. So they have to explain the reasons why they do uh, that selection of cases. And sometimes in the past they said, well, because we have reason, we have received 
information that indicates that something is suspicious. Yes, they have been doing that and they can do that much better if we talk about what arises from digital data. Now, imagine the tremendous problems that we have in the field of VAT in the European Union with fraud. And also consider that some countries have started going for electronic VAT invoices. Well, from that perspective, we can come with a much faster and a much better selection based on digital data than the one that we could do at the time where we had paper invoices and the like. So, in other words, I think that this is something which uh, shows that digital administration uh, may not depart or, or may not deprive tax authorities of their obligation to give a re to make a reasoned selection of cases, but it just makes it easier and better because it provides more data and provides a selection of data that is already possibly structured along a criterion. So again, uh, what we learn from the perspective of taxpayers' rights in this case is that we have to um, make use of, uh, of these advantages that we receive from the digital administration era, but that tax authorities remain obliged to give reasons for the selection of their cases. And this allows me also to say that we should shy away from the fact, from the, from the, the situations in which we can just say, well, this has been selected by the machine. This has come out of the machine. Uh, it must, there must be a reason. No, that's not okay. That's not depriving uh, the taxpayer of his, its or her right to a motivated audit. Now, fact finding is one thing, but the use and processing of this information is another matter. So we need to make sure that we comply with, uh, you know, the uh, foundations of the uh, fundamental rights of taxpayers. The taxpayer has the right to understand the reasons for the request for an additional payment of tax or for providing supplying information that uh, is uh, in fact different from the one that he thought he had already supplied. Now, I think that it's quite important also to understand that um, this is a process which is not just about fact finding, but it's also about applying the facts to the law. Now, you can say that the law can also be learned by artificial intelligence, and I wish I could agree with that, but I'm not so sure that I, in fact, can. Um, you know, legal interpretation is a process of understanding um, what the uh, words included in a statute concretely mean and how they apply to the fact. Um, this is a process which uh, goes beyond fact finding and law finding is sometimes more delicate than it can otherwise be. Now, we have heard also in some countries that there are experimental, uh, you know, procedures for even using artificial intelligence, which learns from the past cases also in respect of judgments. But I really wonder whether that uh, time, um, whether that is already possible because of the numerous nuances that law has, because of the fact that we have to ponder all factual elements, but still determine what could be extracted from some words in a given context. And also because in some cases, we, um, you end up in situations where with legal interpretation, we explore uh, meanings of the statutes which have never applied until that moment. I mentioned the Berlioz judgment before. The Berlioz judgment on mutual assistance and the legal standing of taxpayers is something which we have never heard before in that context. So, you know, I want to say that what has happened in the past can be important uh, to uh, predict 
how a given law can apply to a given situation. And therefore, this can also be used in order to prevent incompliance. So, you know, this uh, this type of tools which can be made available by tax authorities can also enhance compliance and prevent possible incompliance. However, uh, you know, that only remains at the level in which we can have some potential indicators for what is wrong, what is right. But, uh, you know, many indicators are not where uh, are not uh, the have not do not have the same uh, value of evidence and sometimes for evidence we need more. Now another uh, uh, topic that I have selected for this final conference of the research project, something that has come out during the research is the so-called ABS data. And of course, you know, sometimes lawyers use too many expressions in Latin. After all, when we speak English, we use this as a common language. But at the end of the day, we know that uh, when we do research, English is just a language to communicate. So sometimes also using expressions uh, to indicate something which could be equivalent to the right of access. Um, it is uh, something that brings together with this expression a number of additional elements. And the right to access, the right of access in the context of ABIAS data is connected with the right of a person to be informed about all the elements that, in this case, tax authorities have uh, and concerning that specific taxpayer or private parties, private party. So uh, it is about the documents that tax authorities um, hold. But in my view, uh, in the context of this research, uh, I think that it is also meaningful to uh, understand, uh, you know, how can taxpayers uh, protect their legal sphere against uh, improperly construed algorithms? Now, we know that algorithms come out with a result. And the result is the outcome of the way in which input has been processed. Well, I want to stress that if we uh, look back at this rights, we cannot just say that we want to have motivation, uh, you know, that there is an obligation to motivate the algorithms because the algorithms are just a formula that yields a result. However, what we can do from the perspective of ABS data is also trying to understand what is put in the algorithms. If wrong information, if wrong input is included in the formula, then wrong output is unavoidable. And once wrong output comes, then we can't do anything about that. It's just wrong and we do not know because the algorithm is not transparent. So rather than approaching the problems of, uh, let's say, crazy algorithms at the level of motivation, we should approach them at the level of, uh, you know, having some kind of checks and balances on what is put in the algorithms. Because if we say that, for instance, in some cases, we have to uh, comply with some systems and the system improperly interprets the law, then you know we might have difficulties. So, for instance, if we say that uh, you know that a given payment has been made, and in fact this payment has not been made, and if we say that the right, the entitlement to a payment equals the actual payment, and then the person hasn't received the payment in a year, then the algorithm builds up this in a formula that can create some very uh, inappropriate repercussions. So as I said, and I want to conclude this part on the national context, as I said, uh, algorithms are important and we should not shy away from using them in order to improve what can be done in the framework of enhancing the fight against non-compliance, but we have to build them up properly and we have to make sure that the information that is behind them is technically correct because otherwise uh, artificial intelligence will uh, basically, we know that artificial intelligence is machine learning. If machine learns from mistakes, it makes more mistakes. And then of course, the rule of law goes to the dustbin. Let's go now to the cross-border context. The cross-border context is also, let's say the last focal point of my presentation. And I also want to stress that it's quite important to understand 
that um, uh, uh, different issues may arise across the borders. And those issues uh, can be problematic uh, also because of uh, different levels of data protection. Yes, certainly when we talk about abundance of data, we need to make sure that there is an adequate protection of the system and the adequate protection of the system is against possible cyber attacks, but at the same time, it's also a, a, a suitable protection against unauthorized disclosure of information. Well, uh, here we talk about something which is uh, certainly very delicate, taking into account that in the European Union, we have a common standard, which is GDPR uh, related, and in the rest of the world, we generally have lower standards of data protection. Now, the fact that we have lower standards of data protection could also justify that in some cases uh, there are issues when tax authorities exchange information with other tax authorities which do not secure the same levels of protection of data or which can use that data uh, for uh, improper purposes, uh, which could also be related. After all, we should not forget that we are uh, at times of war and there could be potential situation that could further escalate. So I think it's quite important uh, that we stress that uh, damage should be prevented rather than compensated for in case of violation. Once uh, some information, sensitive data uh, uh, becomes, uh, in, uh, you know, becomes in, uh, publicly available, it's almost impossible to block it. So I think that this is something which brings us to question whether the framework for exchanging information automatically could uh, uh, continue the way that it has uh, grown over the past few years. Now, automatic exchange of information is certainly fundamental for digital administration because digital administration cannot survive without data. It's just like a body that cannot survive without food. The body processes food and transforms into energy for uh, surviving. And, uh, you know, the, uh, um, you know the, the digital administration processes that information to make sure that there is enough protection of, um, uh, against non-compliance. But uh, here I really see that, um, you know, one of the results of the research is that there should be a fundamental difference between EU and non-EU countries. Uh, also because in the EU there is an effective protection of data uh, which also uh, includes possible sanctions in the case of violation. And uh, then I want to combine this. You might remember that before I was mentioning this Berlioz judgment, I want to combine that to uh, further uh, speculate on the notion of foreseeable relevance and the rule of law. Now, uh, foreseeable relevance doesn't mean just that it is certainly not harming and that the more data, the merrier. Um, we are now uh, preparing for, a, uh, for a, uh, another conference which has been organized uh, also by IBFD, but in cooperation with the, the, the former taxpayers advocate in the US, and it's an international conference on taxpayers' rights. And we have noticed that the start, that statistics become, start becoming available as to the fact that uh, a part of the information that is collected, including through FATCA, is simply uh, useless for uh, enhancing the fact against non-compliance. Well, the point is that uh, the legislator determines a standard and essentially that information is regarded by the legislator as foreseeably relevant. We're not talking about exchange of information upon request. We're talking about the fact that the legislator requests that information, creates an extra cost for the banks, and the banks essentially just say, do you have an American passport? Do you have less than a million dollars uh, that you want to put on my bank account? No, I'm not interested. You can go and put your money in, uh, in another bank account. 
Well, I mean, of course, I've been a bit exaggerating those matters, but when we hear the word foreseeable relevance in tax matters, we are used to think about Article 26 of the OECD Model Convention and exchange of information upon request. Well, the issue is really questioning what the legislator does and the extent to which the information that is required is to be shared at the international level uh, in all possible scenarios. Uh, at the end of the day, we know that this is to uh, protect uh, against tax non-compliance. We know that in the uh, traditional context of Article 26, it protects the uh, requested authority from supply having to supply too much information, but we also want to make the point that it is meaningful and it makes sense that uh, we do not overburden um, private parties with the obligation to supply that information. Now, those who know me well, they know that I am implicitly referring to mandatory disclosure, just like what we call DAC6 in the European Union. But I mean, more in general, I think that uh, there should be a mechanism of checks and balances also in connection with the amount of information that can be requested to private parties. When we started with the mechanism of involving third parties in the levying of taxes or withholding them at source, that was it. And it was obvious and it was logical. But time after time, then we started overburdening them with a number of obligations, also of a formal nature, which are not remunerated. But if you do something wrong, then you have to pay a penalty. So I think that this is something that we should seriously, uh, you know, reconsider for the future. Um, but there are also opportunities that arise from data sharing. And, and that is certainly something which uh, wants to bring me back on the uh, on the line of saying, well, uh, you know, uh, digital administration brings opportunities and not just challenges, because if we gather that information and we are allowed to share it in a way that doesn't vulnerate the fundamental rights of taxpayers, we don't have to ask the taxpayer for that information again. So one country can share that with the other country instead of bothering the taxpayer to supply that information once and twice and three times and so on. So, as I said, not just issues, but also opportunities. And this brings us uh, to the final slide of my presentation, and that is uh, well, I think that uh, the challenges of the uh, protection of taxpayers' rights in the digital administration era are that there should be more international tax coordination. We don't just have to think that there is international tax coordination to fight against non-compliance. We need to have also international tax coordination in order to uh, update uh, the framework within which should be a protection of taxpayers' rights. And that also applies when we have treaties that regulate uh, the powers between two states, because non-state actors of international law are worth receiving protection in tax matters too. I have made several examples which show that algorithms bring challenges and also opportunities, and that we should make sure that uh, it's not just, uh, you know, uh, engineers who uh, determine what the machine should do, but that there is also a proper process that brings together lawyers and economists as to what is put into the formula and that those are transparently monitored. Bear in mind that transparency is fundamental for fairness of tax governance and tax administration and should regulate all matters. There should be no black spot, no blind spot. In this context, if we use uh, those procedures, we can definitely enhance something which is still at its early stage, joint tax audits in the European Union that could potentially uh, optimize fact finding uh, in cross-border situations, and they could even work nicely if the European Union manages to create a legal framework that is 
sufficiently reflecting uh, the difficulties that arise as to the fact that we have different procedural rules in the different countries. More in general, I think that more coordination in this respect and in other matters that I have indicated so far is desirable. Thank you very much for your attention.